Greetings, this is Greg. Let's take a look at a factory Fiat 500 Avart R3T rally car. I want to talk about the car itself, its racing history, and I'll cover all the changes the factory team made to get this car ready for rally racing. Of course, I'll also be talking about the modifications you can make to get a standard 500 Avart's performance up to the R3T levels or beyond. About eight years ago, I had the chance to inspect and photograph this very car. In fact, this video is a remake of the first video I uploaded to this channel. A lot has changed in the last eight years. Fiat Abarts are no longer available new in the United States, so that's a big change. And I became part owner of Euro Compulsion about two years ago, and we have new products that tie into this car, so it made sense to update the video. Fiat built a small number of these cars to compete in the R3T class of rally racing around 2010. There were very few cars in this class, in fact only four of them, obviously the Abarth, plus we have three French entries, the Citroën DS R3T, the Peugeot 207 R3T, and the Renault Clio, the Clio 4 R3T. All the French entries have engines just about exactly 1600 cc's. The Abart is at a disadvantage here with a 1368 cc engine, which is really small, but it makes up for it to an extent with a smaller, lighter car. Normally, these cars were used in events with only one make of car entered. In other words, this class of rally racing was really intended to pit near identical cars against each other, and was often limited to non-professional and or younger drivers trying to prove themselves so they could move up in the sport to the big leagues. That said, the Abart or Abart, I should say, R3T is a fully legit hardcore rally racer. In R3T specs, the Abart's 1368C engine puts out 180 horsepower and 221 pound-feet of torque, which is up quite a bit from the US spec 500 Abart which has only 160 horsepower and 170 pound-feet of torque. That extra 20 horsepower helps to get down the road, but the extra 50 pound-feet of torque really help pull it out of turns at low and mid-range RPM levels. In this type of racing, that's a big help. I've been manufacturing automotive performance parts for a long time. One of the things I've learned is that when the factory guys build a race or ultimate performance version of a car you deal with, it's a really good idea to look and see what they did. So when I heard about this car and had an opportunity to get a good look at it, I jumped on it. Not only is this an actual factory rally car, this example is in pristine original condition. It's never been raced and it's barely even been driven. It's stored underground in Taiwan and is, or at least was at the time, owned by a great guy who was a real enthusiast. I just couldn't have asked for a better opportunity to inspect one of these cars. Starting out with the exterior, it's surprisingly close to the standard streetcar. It doesn't have flared fenders or huge spoilers. All the bodywork, all of it, including the side mirrors, are standard issue on any 500 Abarth. What stands out are those rally lights. Now, they are total overkill for a streetcar, and they're also very expensive. They can be purchased, however. Now, very often you will see R3Ts without these lights. I don't know if they were optional or if they automatically came with the car, but people removed them for daytime racing. Either way, they're not essential if you intend on building a clone. The car has hood pins. The normal hood latching mechanism is gone, which gives a little more room to work on things, and it's more secure in terms of keeping the hood closed when rally racing. Of course, it's less secure from an anti-theft standpoint, so on a streetcar I wouldn't suggest going this route. The car also has special jacking points for rapid servicing during stops. I couldn't photograph those, but it has them. The next thing that stands out is the roof air scoop. I don't think that's something you can easily buy, and in any case, it's not usable on a streetcar, at least not this version of the scoop, and we'll see why when we look at the interior. Moving around to the front of the car, we can see some things that are not on the standard 500 Abarth. Obviously, we have the rally lights. Down below, you can see the skid plate. I was especially interested in looking at this because I manufacture a skid plate for these cars. 
I found the factory skid plate to be very similar to mine in size, shape, and method of attachment, which makes sense since both skid plates cover essentially the same stuff. The R3T skid plate, however, is thicker, which makes sense. Its intended primary use is in WRC type rally races where the extra weight of a heavier skid plate is worth it because of the ridiculous amounts of punishment uh, cars take in those events. The Euro Compulsion skid plate, which is my design, is thick enough to take any type of abuse you could normally encounter in spirited road or track events. I know of people who have broken oil pans on Fiat 500 Abarts. It happened at least once at the Texas Twisted Sisters event. Our skid plate will certainly save you from that. We also did a lot of testing to make sure the airflow across the oil pan wasn't hindered with our design, and we have access holes which make oil changes much easier. You don't need to remove the skid plate to change oil as you do with the factory plastic shield. The access slots in the skid plate allow for easy retrieval of drop tools and or hardware when working on the car, which is a big plus. Anyone who has worked on one of these cars knows what a pain it is to retrieve a dropped nut or bolt in this engine bay. It can turn an easy five minute job into a one hour job. With our skid plate, it becomes easy. Back to the R3T car, we can also see a fairly large front mount intercooler with a side inlet and outlet. The stock street car has twin intercoolers, little ones mounted in the cheeks. The stock setup actually works pretty well at stock power levels for a street car, but Fiat knew that for the power levels with the R3T, and especially for the extended time periods it would be on boost in rally racing, more intercooler was needed. Also, the stock intercooling system tends to develop leaks over time because of the way they design the, the joints and the connections and the piping. That stuff was designed for speed on the assembly line without really any other considerations. At Euro Compulsion, we have an upgraded intercooler, which I think is actually a little better than the R3Ts, and I don't say that lightly. Ours has a significantly larger core, larger diameter tubing with Kevlar reinforcement, and it doesn't require removal of the factory fog lights. Next, we will take a look at the wheels. This car came with white 17x7 OZ wheels on all four corners. This is actually a somewhat common wheel. It's been an option on the US spec Abarts in certain years, and they were used on the US Abarth Challenge cars, so duplicating this, these wheels is absolutely not a problem. They're available. There are other great wheel choices out there as well. I am very partial to Evo Corsas, which are also legitimate rally car wheels. The tires on the R3T are 205, 50, 17, but I've seen two other tire specs posted in the sales literature, so I don't think all of these came with the same tires. The front brake calipers are four piston Brembos. They are grabbing larger than standard ventilated rotors. These are absolutely great brakes. They're also easy to duplicate. This big brake kit is sold by various vendors. The rear brakes use the standard Abar rear calipers and non-vented rotors. I have no way of knowing what pads are being used, but there are many good choices out there, so that's just not a big concern. Although the Brembo brakes are great, and we do have them at Euro Compulsion, I generally suggest a different route here. For all out race applications, I suggest the Willwood kit, this kit upgrades the calipers and rotors front and rear. The Brembo upgrade is front only, and the Willwood kit is actually a little bit less money. And, again, I think it's better. Now, if you're not tracking the car, or seriously tracking the car, the Willwood kit or the Brembos are a bit overkill. For aggressive street driving and occasional track use, I suggest and use upgraded rotors. We have several choices. Combine them with EVC pads and Motul fluid, and the brakes will be more than capable of handling typical track day events and also have great street performance. When it's time to change the brakes, I strongly advise against going with the stock rotors. They are expensive and more importantly, inferior. For example, in my Fiat 500L, we got about 35,000 miles from the first set of brake rotors. Now that was with some hard driving, but I replaced the rotors with the StopTech brand, and they're still within spec over 100,000 miles later, and that includes running at tail of the dragon 
and at the Twisted Sister event in this car. We get calls all the time from people wanting the OEM factory brake rotors, and yes, we have them and we'll be happy to sell them to you, but they're just not a good deal. Back to the car. Notice the wheels are secured by studs and not lug bolts. Studs have some big advantages. First of all, they're stronger, and that may not matter in normal use, but if you've seen rally racing, you know it's pretty extreme, and you can understand why they went with the stronger wheel attachment method. Second, they make it a lot easier to put the wheels on since they line up easily and the wheel stays put once you slide it over the studs. Third, and I hope you never discover this for yourself, but if your wife takes your car somewhere to have the tires changed and Cecil and Sons in Oklahoma manages to strip out the threads, well, with a stud, that's not really a big deal. You could use a pair of vice grips, remove it, and put in a new stud. However, when they strip it out with lug bolts, you will find yourself needing to replace the wheel hub and wheel bearing, which is a pretty big job, an especially big job if it's on one of the front wheels. All my cars run wheel studs. That's an actual Assetto Corsa crate sitting there. It's the only one I've ever seen, so I thought that was exciting. I was not able to get under the car very well, so I really couldn't see as much of the suspension as I would have liked. However, I could determine quite a bit. The main suspension pieces, like the suspension arms and all the attachment points, are standard Fiat 500 Abarth. I think that says a lot about the quality of the standard car. Keep in mind, the Abarth version of this car already has upgraded suspension components. They are significantly upgraded over the standard non-turbo model. So when building the R3T, the factory team had a pretty good car to start with. The car has the standard Abart anti-sway bars, which makes sense to me for a rally car. It has adjustable coilovers on all four corners. The rear shocks have reservoirs, and it has adjustable camber up at the front. I wish I could tell you what coilover kit this car has, but it may not be any specific kit at all. I looked at it as closely as I could, and it does not match up visually with any off-the-shelf kit I know of. However, I can say that if I was trying to duplicate this as closely as I could, and money was no object, I would get the KW V3 coilover kit, no question about it. These are the best you can get for this car. However, for most people, including myself, simply adding better coil springs will probably give you all the improvement you're going to want, and without breaking the bank, that's very economical. And of course, at Euro Compulsion, we have various coil spring options. For street performance, a set of front and rear H&R springs really improves this car. And if you want a further improvement, add in a set of Coney shocks. Moving to the rear of the car, again, it's all pretty close to standard. There's a rear tow hook back here and a special dual exhaust with trumpet type tips. Those are there to make the car louder. The right tip is fine, by the way, that's just a blur in the photograph. The exhaust itself is really nothing special. I haven't seen this exact, this exact setup for sale anywhere, but looking at it, it's certainly no better than the best systems that are out there in the aftermarket. It's possible some people will want to build a clone or an approximation of the R3T rally car. And if so, I hope this video helps. I think that's a pretty cool thing to do. A lot of what you see here on this car is pretty easy to duplicate, especially the exterior stuff. However, certain things are not. For example, the roll cage. This car has a very complex, welded-in roll cage. It was made specifically to some FIA rally car specs. However, it's not a streetable cage, and to get the benefit from it in terms of safety, the occupants really have to be wearing harnesses and helmets. Without those things, the cage itself presents a hazard in certain types of crashes because your head could smash into it. One drawback of the factory rally car is that it's not street legal in most countries. And just getting one of these things into the United States would be a big problem because its T-Jet engine was never emission certified over here. However, reproducing the car's engine performance with a standard US spec car is actually pretty easy. Let's move to the back of the car and open the hatch. I mentioned earlier that this car is mostly or totally original. It's not exactly true. It's not quite all original. This car has only one very minor modification. Can you guess what it is? 
And if you really want to guess by staring at this picture for a while, just pause the video. It has a different fuel filler nozzle on the fuel cell, which allows it to be fueled from a normal roadside gas pump. That makes a lot of sense. And it could be switched back to the mechanism by which they put fuel into it at rally racing at any time if desired. In this picture, we can see that the car has an ATL fuel cell. My best guess is that it's a 60 liter or 15.85 gallon cell. What you're actually looking at is a carbon fiber cover and of course I couldn't take any of this stuff apart to investigate but that's what it looks like to me. You can also see a bottle for the Saybelt fire extinguishing system and on that subject this car has nozzles for that system seemingly everywhere in the cabin in the engine compartment and it has a lot of them. A spare tow hook and the incredible roll cage are visible here as well. Moving into the driver's area, we can see that it has fresh air vents, which are fed by that roof scoop. Notice the screen just aft of the vents. That's for cabin exhaust. I like this device since it lets fresh air in and stale air out. However, I don't think it's usable on a streetcar because of its proximity to your head. In an accident, it would be dangerous to anyone not wearing a helmet. Here's a shot of the driver's seat and most of the controls. Right away, we see that it has a Saybelt steering wheel, no airbag, and where the normal gauges would be, we have nothing but a few lights. The main display is located above the hazard lights button. This is the Magneti Morelli MDU data display unit. It's the HAL 9000 of Rally computers. You can buy them, but it's very hard to find a vendor that sells them and the only one I actually could find for sale was $4,800, and that was about six years ago. I, have, I don't think I've seen any since. The large flat metal bar coming up from the floor with the black handle is the parking brake. It's totally different from the one that's in the standard car, the road car. It operates its own little hydraulic system. It's not pulling on a cable. Rally drivers use the parking brake a lot on super tight turns, especially in front drive cars like this. And the guys who built this thing were super serious about that parking brake. I've read that this is exactly what prevents the car from being road legal in Europe where most of these were sold, but I'm not 100% sure that that's true. The gray handle lever near the steering wheel is the shifter. This thing has a six speed sequential gearbox with a self-locking differential. It's a full race setup. Now these parts are obtainable, but at tremendous cost, generally more than the cost of buying an entire uh, used 500 Abart, Abart, I should say. That's another thing. Historically, every time I've heard the name of, of Abart, it was always pronounced Abarth. And, and I worked for Al Cosentino, and that's how he said it, and he knew Carlo Abart. However, when they came back to the United States in 2012, there were a bunch of different pronunciations being used. But I was there when my son-in-law, Toby, who's one of the bigger players at Euro Compulsion, uh, talked to Annalise Abart herself, who was Carlo Abart's wife. And he asked her specifically, you know, could you clear up this confusion for us? And she was very clear. It's Abart. So if you hear me use a different pronunciation, that's because I have decades of saying it a different way, and now I'm trying to say it the way uh, Carlo Abart's wife herself uh, said to pronounce it. Anyhow, let's get back to the matter at hand. You're probably starting to see what I mean about some of these things being very difficult and or expensive to duplicate. That roll cage, the parking brake setup, the transmission, differential, data display unit, all of these things are tough to come by and very expensive. Not to mention all that carbon fiber in the interior. I don't even know where to start trying to source that. Now, at a certain point here, the real thing starts to look like a pretty decent deal if you want to go rally racing. Let's look at the various switches. Starting from the bottom of the center pedestal, we have the main power switch. It is a guarded switch and basically connects the battery to the car's electrical system. Next up is the three position ignition switch. It has off, key, which is really accessory, and on, which means ignition on. It's just like your key operated switch in a road car, except that it cannot activate the starter. 
Moving up, we have a kill button and a map light. Continuing on up, we have Pumpa 1 and Pumpa 2. Pumpa is Pumpa. These are the dual fuel pumps. The engine will run on either one. It has two entirely for redundancy. The switches control the big lights up front. One switch for left, one for right. The starter button activates the starter only. It will crank the motor over all day long, and it won't start if you forgot to turn on the ignition or the fuel pumps. The ability to operate the starter, ignition, and fuel pumps independently from each other is a very useful feature when troubleshooting or servicing the car. The big red knob you see activates, aka discharges, the fire extinguishing system. On the right side of the console, there are two more buttons. I think the red one turns on the AC compressor, but I'm not absolutely sure of that. The green button scrolls to different displays on the MDU display unit. There is a black button on top of the console for the horn. Let's go to the back of the car for a moment. Now that you know what to look for, you can see the cabin exhaust port on the rear of the roof scoop. Although it's not visible, this car has a rear skid plate. It's every bit as awesome as the front skid plate. The rear plate's main function is to protect the fuel cell. Remember in the factory car, the fuel tank is in a different position and it's pretty well protected, but when they build a rally car, the fuel cell has to be located in a slightly different position. Plus you have the, the roll cage in there and they have to protect it against different types of accidents. So part of that protection is this rear skid plate. Now, it's time to take a look at the engine. I want to explain how to duplicate the performance or power levels of the R3T's engine in a standard US spec car. According to Fiat documentation, the official sources, this engine puts out 180 flywheel horsepower and 300 newton meters of torque, which works out to about 221 foot-pounds. The European spec, 500 abarts, upon which the R3T car is based, have the 1368cc T-Jet engine. Keep in mind, we never had this engine in the United States. 180 horsepower and 221 pound-feet of torque is within easy reach for this engine with a good intake, intercooler exhaust, and the 1446 turbo, all of which the R3T car has. Tuning the car to that power level with these mods already in place is quite easy because the T-Jet car has an older Bosch ECU or engine control unit, which is very straightforward from a tuning perspective. All US spec cars have the multi-air version of this engine. The two engines are substantially similar, but differ primarily in the way the intake valves are actuated. And the multi-air engine also uses a Magneti Morelli engine computer rather than that more simplistic Bosch unit. So what engine mods did the factory guys do? Well, quite a lot. Let's start with the intake. I like the design. It takes in cold ram air at the front of the car in such a way that it's not going to ingest a lot of dust and debris. It goes through a canister type carbon fiber filter made by BMC, which is a decent brand. And from there through some couplers and a metal pipe into the turbo. While I like the design, this is one of the few cases on the R3T where I don't like the execution. They apparently didn't have time to make an actual molded intake. This thing is just made up of off-the-shelf generic parts. The small piping and ribbed flexible inlet tube will hurt flow at really high power levels, but for 180 to 200 horsepower, it's okay, except that it looks like a 12-year-old with access to my scrap bin made it. I just don't think its appearance does justice to the awesomeness of the overall car. The turbocharger is the Garrett 1446. At the time this car was built, that was a very rare upgrade. It wasn't often seen on these cars. However, by 2012, it was standard on various higher trim European models of the car, and it was standard on all US spec cars, which is nice. So if you want to duplicate the R3T's level of power or go even higher with a US spec car, you already have the right turbo. The turbo blows through an upgraded intercooler, which we talked about earlier. Again, Euro Compulsion 
offers a similar looking but larger and functionally superior intercooler upgrade. Notice the car has Bosch coil packs. Those were standard equipment on the European cars and are trouble-free. The US spec car has coil packs which are somewhat troublesome in this application. I suggest switching over to Bosch coil packs from an Alfa Romeo 4C. We stock these at Euro Compulsion. They are plug and play and at a good price. They are what I run on my Fiat 124. I have a video about my 124 running at the drag strip if you're interested. Uh, the short version is it has 220 proven wheel horsepower. And you can mod a 500 A bar the same way, get about the same results. We also have the Ignition Products brand of coil packs. And if money is no object, those are the ones to get. The engine itself and the components like pistons, cam, head, manifolding, etc. are all standard Fiat 1.4 T-Jet, which is great news for someone wanting to duplicate this engine or at least its power characteristics. The T-Jet engine was the version used on European spec cars. Again, in the U.S., we got the multi-air engine, which is generally superior but has some drawbacks in terms of performance modifications primarily related to options with the camshaft. Notice the crankcase ventilation system has a little extra mini cone filter on it. I've noticed at least two different configurations for this vent system on the R3T cars. In any case, don't let this make you think they are normally venting all the crankcase fumes to the atmosphere. They are not. It has full provisions to vent it to the intake manifold when off boost and into the intake tube when on boost. We don't duplicate this setup exactly at Euro Compulsion, but we do offer a kit which adds an additional air oil separator, which is a good upgrade for a car that is going to experience hard street or any type of track use. Here you can see components of the upgraded hydraulic system for the brakes and the parking brake. There's an aluminum fitting you can see there in the upper right hand corner with a little hole in it. That's one of the many fire extinguisher nozzles. Those nozzles are all over the place in the car. The way the engine gets its power is no secret. They're just taking a, the basic 1.4 T-Jet, adding the 1446 turbo, again that's the standard US spec turbo, then adding an intake, intercooler, and exhaust. That alone gets it pretty close to the 180 horsepower. To bump the torque up to 221 or 220, whatever it is, they only needed to increase peak boost up to about 22 PSI, and then only for a very short period in the RPM range. Up high where peak power is made, boost is probably down around 15 PSI. I haven't driven the car, let alone measured ever anything, so that's my estimate. In short, duplicating this power level for this engine in a US spec car is pretty easy and it won't break the bank. If you go with a good intake, intercooler, and exhaust, you're most of the way there in terms of horsepower. Add in a tune and it will easily meet or exceed those levels of power and torque. At Euro Compulsion, we have quite a few tuning options for this car. Our phase zero tune is the one which most closely approximates the R3T's power. Torque is very nearly the same, but our phase zero tune has more power. Now, if you want, Toby at Euro Compulsion can make you a tune that more closely approximates the R3T's tune, but I'm not sure why you would want to do that. We have better options. Most people who go through the expense and trouble of adding our intercooler then run the phase two tune, which is quite a bit more powerful than the R3T tune. Also, don't overlook phase one from Euro Compulsion. It is rock solid. In fact, in some ways, phase one makes the most sense. It doesn't require any additional upgrades. You can run it with the stock intake, intercooler, exhaust, and so on. And the tune alone makes the car quick enough to beat most of the minis that are out there, the, the Miatas, even modified ones, Toyobarus, and other cars that are normally quicker than a stock 500 Abar. Obviously, you're not going to beat everything on the street, no matter what you do. But phase one makes the car much more competitive at the track or in the stoplight Grand Prix. I should mention that you get any two of these tunes up to phase two with our base package. And via the sport button, you can use both. A lot of people put the 695 tune in non-sport mode, largely, I think, because they like the way it sounds. 
and phase one or two into sport mode. Exterior mods like the lights and wheels are no problem, just expensive. The brakes are no problem either. You can get that exact Brembo kit and there are quite a few other options. For 90% of performance enthusiasts, I really think better quality rotors, pads, and high temp fluid is more than good enough. There are plenty of suspension mods out there. I would probably go with a good quality coil over kit. Now, this is one area that separates Euro Compulsion from the other vendors. If you call us or email or whatever, you're communicating with someone who drives these cars. We didn't get into the Fiat market when Fiat came back to the United States in 2012. A lot of our competitors did. They were selling parts for Minis and Hyundais and the like. And when Fiat showed up, they saw this market as a cash grab. And most of them stopped developing stuff for these cars a few years ago. That's not the case with us. Our company can trace its roots with Fiat's and Alfa Romeo's back to 1982 when my dad started this as Bob's House of Fiat, now HPSI, which I still own. Then we bought out Euro Compulsion about two to maybe almost three years ago. Now my son and son-in-law run things there, so it's in its we're in our third generation doing this. The point is, we're here to stay, and we are still developing stuff for these cars, and we're going to be here to help you when you need us. When you call us, you're talking to someone who knows these cars. For example, Alexander usually is the one who answers his fo answers the phone. He has a lot of time driving Fiats. He drives a 500 to work almost every day. He drives both Fiats and Alphas at the track. So when you call, he can give you really solid advice and describe things accurately so you can make the best choices about the direction you want to go with your suspension, for example. Now, my advice for the suspension is to go with KW V3s if money is no object or if you're going for all-out performance. For further improvements, add in the Elgato chassis brace and, if desired, a bigger rear anti-sway bar. The bar changes the handling characteristics more than it improves it, I would say. It'll cause it to understeer a little bit less, but add that anti-sway bar last as you might like the car without it with the coilovers alone. I do. If you don't want coilovers, go with the H&R springs and Coney shocks on a street car that gives as much performance as a typical coilover kit, but at a much lower cost. I hope you enjoyed this video. I look forward to reading your comments and hearing what you think of the R3T rally car. I really like it, but then again, I like all the 500 Abarts. I wish Fiat had updated them to keep them competitive instead of just giving up, but that's another story. Please visit us at eurocompulsion.net. We have a lot of new products coming for the Fiat 500s and 124s. We also have some exciting stuff on the way for various Alfa Romeos, both old and new. Plus, we're branching out into the EcoBoost Mustang, which is pretty exciting. Check out the Euro Compulsion channel right here on YouTube. That's all for now. Thank you for watching and have a great day.